duck-billed platypus, Australasia. From New Guinea in the north to the old unfrozen Antarctic continent, you will find marsupials, pouched animals, the only continent in the world to possess them. And more incredible, the dividing line between them, named the Wallace Line, 10 miles apart, totally different speciation. From the Indian subcontinent to the north, tigers and rhinoceros. To the south, the continent of Australasia, the land of the bouncing kangaroo. What on earth can explain this? We're going to find out. Just Google a map of Australia and Indonesia. Between Indonesia's Bali and neighbouring island Lombok is a slim 10 mile sea channel. This is the start of the thousands miles long Wallace Line stretching from New Guinea to the north right down to Antarctica. Now it's not only a dividing geological etching beneath the sea, it's also a biological division. On one side roams the bouncing kangaroo and platypus. On the other, man-eating tigers. South is Australia, north the Philippines, India and beyond. Remarkably, this extends to both plant, fish and animal species. From sulphur-crested cockatoos on one side of the Wallace line, to Indonesian finches just across the sea channel. From fire prone gum trees to exotic tropical rainforest teak and ebony. Even beneath the sea, in an area separated by a mere 10 miles, this incredible separation of fish life stares you in the face. From Australasia to the Antarctic lies a unique zone of flora and fauna. Sir Alfred Wallace was the first to stumble upon this imponderable confrontation of alienated species. Down at heel, he relentlessly sent specimens back to the rich London collectors' galleries. This business acumen funded his obsessive drive to research the secrets of nature. Both Alfred Wallace and Charles Darwin were co-authors of the radical natural selection theory of evolution. The Victorian era of the 1850s was the age of reason. These two twisted their theory to try and encompass the bizarre Wallace line contradiction. Their explanations hovered around deep seas too hard to navigate by swimming kangaroos to isolation of one species by an earlier disappearing land bridge. Both Darwinian fantasies. So this is where Charles Darwin worked and lived for over 40 years. What a brilliant observer. From HMS Beagle through South America and around the world, he observed, filed animals, plants. He explained the development of species by natural selection over thousands and millions of years. What a beautiful rural outlook. Plantations, hills in the distance. Mythology says they skip like lambs. The founders of modern geology, Hutton and Lyle, looked out on landscapes like this and they saw the rain falling, the wind, even if it was storms and tempests, it gradually changed the landscape. Slow erosion, slow deposition down to the valleys. Their idea was that it took millions and millions of years to form this landscape, sometimes the sea would slowly come in, depositing shells, bones, and then recede, explaining the many layers. This 
is known as the theory of uniformity. Even Darwin was influenced by these ideas. His idea was evolution by slow change, natural selection. But they were all radically wrong. However, eventually Darwin's ideology was accepted by consensus and its powerful dogma crucified any dissenters. It was only later that Alfred Wallace reformatted this theory and expounded a totally new concept. The co-founder of the modern theory of evolution also believed in a controlling intelligence, a guiding hand. Wallace's embrace of this controlling intelligence is one of the forgotten episodes of modern science. To quote him, neither natural selection or the general feeling of evolution can give any account whatsoever of the origin of conscious life. We may go even further. I believe there are certain physical characteristics of the human race that are not explicable by the theory of variation or survival of the fittest. According to Wallace, to produce such exquisite features as the human brain, evolution required guidance from what he called an overruling intelligence. But Wallace's demand for an overriding intelligence still didn't explain this sharp division of species either side of the Wallace line. The tiger on one side dramatically different to the marsupials, the kangaroo on the other. Was there something else involved? Now let's step back a minute. Remember this is also a geological dividing line. The Wallace line is impregnated right upon the Pacific Ring of Fire. Volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis running along this boundary. Was this somehow implicated in this dramatic change of species? Could they be involved in genetic change as well? Speciation is an incredible area of scientific dispute. My opinion is that Darwin's natural selection theory with its reliance on millions of years to obtain species change is well outdated by modern scientific scenarios and facts. Nevertheless, natural selection rationalization is endlessly adhered to in scientific papers as a time-driven paradigm. Are there better explanations for the formation of species? The geological etching boundary along the Wallace line may introduce a powerful key. It may clarify why there are radically opposing species of flora and fauna on either side of the Wallace line. Now the electric universe sees much of Earth's geological formations as the result of electrical etching. What's that, you might say? We can show this micro-mimicked in plasma laboratories. Both dendritic formations and sharply carved scarps are the result of different modalities of massive current flow. Etching can be on a huge scale. Such a possible scenario is shown in the etching of the Martian landscape in the theoretical Thunderbolts film in the case of the Wallace line, it runs along a boundary marked by steep underwater sharp-faced cliffs. Now, if electric machining moved along such a boundary in such an extreme way, then the resulting discharges may well have affected the chromosomes of the various life forms. This electromagnetic discharge may have stimulated an adaptive species readjustment named polyploidy. Could a continent-wide plasma discharge event drive unique species formation over a wide area? What a question. Now here things start to get a bit complex, but just bear with me. My hypothesis is this. The Earth's been struck a number of times 
by a series of catastrophes. From subatomic particle bombardment to the whole spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. What's that done to the geography of the Earth, the peoples of the Earth and other species? Let's dig a bit deeper. Okay, now getting back to the, let's say, the mass destruction of the megafauna, the mammoths and many other animals, mm. trees as well at that time, vegetation. We think that's a strong possibility uh, it was involved with planetary disturbances. Rick Firestone seems to think a comet. The other one he uh, suggests is possibly uh, an exploding nebula from um, outside the universe and an inrush of synchrotron radiation, uh, perhaps uh, many ions of different nature, positive and negative. Mm. What would you say to that? Those his thoughts on that? Well, as I said uh, earlier, <clears throat> the extinction of the dinosaurs required something far more uh, spectacular and global than just an impact or even several impacts uh, because A, you had to uh, transfer enough charge to change the Earth's gravity dramatically uh, and B, the, uh, not only uh, the um, gravity change but also the amount of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere there's a whole raft of things which had to change Okay. Uh, okay. and the megaflora also was different yeah, after it's different then. Different size. Yes, yeah. uh, and also functioned in a different way. Um, you began to have flowering plants and all that kind of thing. So the environment of the Earth changed dramatically. It yeah. wasn't just a simple a, a mechanical would think impact. That something was affecting the DNA. In actual fact, they were reacting to this new. That's environment. right. Yes, yes. Uh, this, for instance, the, it seems the light on the Earth changed too because um, uh, plants grow. Uh, most strongly in red light, yeah. which and the ancients, the most ancient stories we have talk about the purple dawn of creation. In other words, it was dim and it was uh, had a purplish colour, which would have predominantly been red and violet. Okay. And uh, uh, red and ultraviolet are both useful in the biological world. Both those uh, frequencies. And if the plants function differently, perhaps our brains did as well. Well, also, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that could explain <laughs> canoe form and all sorts of things. <laughs> okay, now one other thought, apart from a, a solid body strike, mm. which really is covered, I think, with uh, comet theories, mm. is um, the CME, the coronal mass ejections, these huge energy outbursts from the sun. Now, they're, they're thought particularly to affect the weather mm. and many other things on Earth. Do you think they'd be powerful enough, as we see them at least, to affect the no. Earth in this dramatic way? No. Uh, the reason being that the material in the coronal mass ejection is uh, basically hydrogen yeah. and uh, light elements mostly. The, um, also the distance of the sun and the uh, diffuseness of the material would not have any significant effect uh, on the Earth, um, apart from the radiation. Uh, but even that uh, would not account for the sorts of things that we see in these, uh, these global extinctions, because there's a lot of physical activity going on as well, deposition of material, uh, changes in the landscape, which also is recorded by uh, ancient uh, peoples. You know, the Australian yeah. Aborigine uh, talks about the rainbow snake uh, changing the landscape before their eyes, yeah. uh, creating mountains and, uh, and water holes and uh, all this kind of thing. And accompanying these major cosmic plasma discharge events are a litany of broad spectrum bombardments, from particles to the full spectrum of electromagnetic wavelengths. For instance, gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet rays, visible light rays, infrared rays, microwaves, and radio waves, to beta particles, which are electrons, and alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, and other much heavier nuclei. But amazingly, they all have different effects on the basic reproductive building block of nature, the DNA packed chromosomes. They are potent encouragers of polyploidy adaption. It seems that Wallace is intelligent design seizes the chromosomes and they automatically harmonize to this new paradigm.
their numerous species immediately adapt to the new enchantment of the invasive electromagnetic spectrum. Smaller, bigger, marsupial mammal, all the various existing species recognize the new optimal functionality and intelligently activate using polyploidy to adapt. Wallace would have understood this. Not millions of years as theorized by natural selection. No, immediate speciation. Most of this electromagnetic arsenal has been shown to dramatically affect speciation, but each with significantly different results, but harder to reproduce in the animal species. This process is the intelligent, adaptable world of polyploidy, something that Wallace predicted. Most living organisms are locked into a two-chromosome reproductive process, diploidy. But polyploidy allows the chromosomes to form new species instantaneously. Thus, a specimen under extreme provocation forms new species immediately. Darwin's theory of slow evolution by natural selection is no longer viable. Instead, catastrophic evolution occurs. We see the sudden and total death of megafauna such as the mammoth or the giant kangaroos suddenly being supplanted by smaller species. I believe this is an adaption of the DNA to new electromagnetic environments. Small kangaroos take over from large kangaroos and all of a sudden a new species has evolved. Under the influence of an extreme coronal mass ejection, a comet, a meteor, a planet in disturbed motion, or even an exploding nebula from outside the solar system, the electromagnetic spectrum reverts to chaos. It forms a new harmonic. The DNA instantly reacts to this extreme provocation. It intelligently but miraculously adapts to this spectrum of extreme celestial chaos. In a process called polyploidy, if the provocation is extreme enough, the DNA instantly creates a new species. Darwin got it wrong. It's not natural selection. It's the intelligent process of polyploidy that creates new species. This means that the megafauna's extinction was followed by the creation of new Australian fauna. It could also explain the divergence of the Australian Aborigine. Both extreme heat and the chemical culture scene are used by humans in everyday processes to induce polyploidy and hence totally new usable species. Neutrons, a normal byproduct of intense electrical discharges by lightning, seem to be the safest at producing polyploidy in the animal kingdom. Is it beyond the pale that kangaroos as well as plants and fish were sent off on a genetic leap under chaotic conditions to adapt to a totally new provocation. Could Wallace's line be the boundary of a huge species altering plasma event? Could plasma discharge be the tool of speciation? In extreme circumstances, could mammals too have an inbuilt emergency adaption? Is there such evidence? I think probably. As Harvard paleontologist S.J. Gould notes, without exception, there has never been a new species without a preceding mass extinction. Fossil records demonstrate that a species remain unchanged for millions of years before abruptly disappearing. Gradualism is not a fact of nature. Most new species appear with a bang. 
nature does take leaps. Wallace himself, when contemplating the world's mass extinctions, concluded, there must have been some physical cause for this great change. And it must have acted almost simultaneously over large portions of the world's surface. Such an area is Australasia. Yeah.